Final Fantasy is a series that has been around as long as most of us have been alive, if not longer. It's a series that has looked very, very different throughout its lifetime and has probably played one of the biggest roles in the shaping of gaming itself. Today, GameRanks wants to bring you on a trip through the evolution of Final Fantasy. Now, for the sake of everyone's sanity, we're going to stick to the mainline Final Fantasy games because there's an absurd number of Final Fantasy games, and if we get too far out of the main line, stuff's gonna get a little wild. The original Final Fantasy was published by Square in 1987. It's certainly not the first game of its kind, and the creators outwardly credit inspiration in Ultima and Wizardry. It has an interesting development story, but Square originally didn't want to get into the RPG genre, but the success of Dragon Quest in Japan changed their minds. The first Final Fantasy pretty much made a roadmap that would be followed throughout the entire series. There's an overworld map, town and dungeon maps, a menu screen, and a battle mode. If you've played any Final Fantasy, these probably sound very familiar. But because not every single person in the world has, the overworld map functions as a means for you to traverse the game's fictional world. The maps are usually not to scale, as if they were your character would be the size of a castle, so it's not exactly Skyrim-type open-world transversal, but you do definitely get a sense of a large world that you're a part of. Battles could occur on the overworld, and we'll talk about those in a minute, but towns were a safe area, occupied by villagers who had things to say, and shops where you could purchase supplies. On top of that, towns were typically places where you would find an inn where you could rest and replenish your health. In the Final Fantasy series, a town feels like a break, a minute to breathe, and sometimes a place where a lot of figuring out what we do next happens. Dungeons are places where the worst of the world resides. Monsters hiding in caves ready to pounce on you attack, but there were also treasure chests and things to be found. Battles could occur everywhere but towns, and that included dungeons. The battle system was turn-based, and all the actions that you could do occupied menus that you made selections from. When the character's turn came up, so did that menu. You selected their actions and they would perform them. There could be regular enemies, boss enemies, and you could either physically attack or use magic. This was a fantasy game, remember? And you could also use various items. Many familiar themes in the game, both in the narrative and in the music, are on display here in Final Fantasy I. The crystals and heroes of destiny from different corners of the planet coming together to save the world. The fate of everyone rested on the shoulders of some diverse heroes with amazing abilities. The story's just a bit convoluted, but for a first try at least it's complex. To boil it down, an evil knight kidnaps a princess seeking immortality, he turns into an archdemon eventually, you end up having to go back in time 2,000 years. The graphics of Final Fantasy are actually awesome for the NES. The world of Final Fantasy was very distinct in the places you went, despite the limited palette and resolution. The creator of Final Fantasy, Hironobu Sakaguchi, never believed that it would be a series, and so he didn't design the story to be expanded to one. However, Final Fantasy I was received as such a big success on the part of Square that a sequel was inevitable, and so began the tradition of having every Final Fantasy game be its own self-contained story in its own self-contained world. The original Final Fantasy received acclaim in both Japan and in North America, but its sequel was not released in North America, instead being a Japan-only game. Final Fantasy II starts with an attack on the main characters by Black Knight soldiers and gets swept up in a resistance dedicated to ending the tyranny of an evil empire. The quest takes a lot of twists and turns from finding mithril metal to make better weapons for the resistance to finding out that one of the people originally attacked has taken a very different path and sided with the empire as opposed to a resistance. However, things get a lot more dire after that and the stakes raise significantly. Final Fantasy II's systems didn't remain entirely the same from Final Fantasy I and indicated the willingness to experiment in that the leveling did not come from experience, but rather when you got a sword, for instance, the way you used the sword or how much you used the sword progressed your abilities with the sword. Final Fantasy II was also the first appearance of a character named Sid, which every single mainline Final Fantasy has had since, 
as well as chocobos, the beloved massive birds that people ride around the worlds of Final Fantasy. While Final Fantasy 1's story was complex, at its root was rather rudimentary, and pretty much everybody stayed alive. More emotional aspects of the story started to appear in Final Fantasy 2, with six deaths on the side of good, and different relationships started and explored within the dialogue. The last Final Fantasy to appear on the NES was Final Fantasy 3. The story of Final Fantasy 3 is about four orphans who explore a hidden cavern open up by an earthquake and find the Crystal of Light. The crystal gives them various parts of its power, which essentially amounts to giving them jobs, because Final Fantasy 3 introduced the job system. For instance, you had your knights, your bards, your vikings, your archers, etc. Jobs had special skills, for instance, thieves could steal, and several different classes could cast spells, but the battle system remained turn-based and pretty similar to how it always had been. Final Fantasy IV came out in 1991. In North America, it was known as Final Fantasy II, as Final Fantasy II and III had not been released stateside. Now, obviously, this caused a lot of confusion later, but thankfully, they've renumbered everything stateside as well because we have access to all the games now, at least in some form. Final Fantasy IV has some serious credit to its name, and obviously, the stories prior to this contain dramatic elements, but most of what people consider dramatic storytelling in, in modern games is on display in Final Fantasy IV. But the game itself was only about one-fourth of the script that had been written for it. The cartridges just couldn't hold the entire script, so unnecessary lines of dialogue was cut. Now, nobody really has any idea whether this improved the game or not, but often limitations create conditions where better things are made. The story of Final Fantasy IV involves a knight named Cecil questioning the king, there's love interests, there's forbidden spells, there's dire consequences, and it contains just about everything that people expect from a Final Fantasy story. Final Fantasy IV was built on the best ideas from the previous Final Fantasy games, from the fleshed out combat of Final Fantasy III, the more complex story of Final Fantasy II, and four elemental bosses acting as symbols in the game from Final Fantasy I. One of the main themes of the game was that brute strength alone isn't necessarily power, and the story really emphasized friendship and a large and diverse cast. It also involves a pretty serious jump in quality and graphics, as they had a significantly larger color palette to be working with. One could say that the first four Final Fantasy games are really the process of creating the Final Fantasy formula, what became Final Fantasy for decades. These games are all impressive in their own right and contain different elements of what we know as today's Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy V didn't really bring us any massive jumps in the ideas, however it did refine everything. The story is again about four elemental objects, this time crystals, and a meteor that has fallen and created curiosity. The crystals seal away an ultimate evil that the cast of characters wish to stop the resurgence of. The story itself is not really looked at is a fantastic one for Final Fantasy. However, the job system that was used here was looked at as heavily refined. You were able to combine abilities from different job classes, and in theory have every single character master all 22 jobs. Every character would earn experience points and level up, but they'd also learn a job with ability points. You might note that this sounds a lot like today's RPG's skill trees, and is most certainly the ancestor. Sometimes the game itself feels repetitive, and this is due to a very high encounter rate, and again that the story is sometimes a little bit weak. But all in all, it's an incredibly worthwhile addition to the series, as it did so much refining of the game's systems that it's hard to believe that Final Fantasy VI could have happened if Final Fantasy V hadn't. And not just in a numerical way, if a different game had been Final Fantasy V, I think Final Fantasy VI would have been significantly different as well. Now there's a lot of debate over the next two entries. A lot of people consider them both to be the best JRPG of all time, and a lot of other people like to argue about that. But let's not get into it. Really, all of the Final Fantasy games are phenomenal in their own ways, and though sometimes maybe a little bit painful, are extremely important in the development of video games themselves. Final Fantasy VI did something very strange. 
It put Final Fantasy in a steampunk environment, where all of the previous titles were set in a medieval high fantasy environment. It's very interesting because there's things like railroads and steamships, but also mechs, chainsaws, and drills. Magic and science are kind of combined into one thing known as Magitech, which are programs created by the Empire to create weaponry, and the narrative does a fantastic job at using the environment to comment on technology, science, and the unknown. The story is extremely non-linear for a Final Fantasy game and diverts in many different directions that you get to choose a lot of different things in. It also does a lot in order to make sure there isn't a specific protagonist. Instead, it wants you to look at the cast of characters as the protagonist. Everyone has their own role, everyone has a purpose, and everyone develops as a person. What's also great is that Kefka, the villain in the series, is not some mythological creature or monster or sorcerer from years past. He's just a guy. In a way, he symbolizes all people and what happens when absolute power is bestowed on them. Final Fantasy VI knocked it out of the park on every level, but the game that really took the world by storm in a way that a game really hadn't before is Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII was an entire revamp of everything we know about Final Fantasy. While Final Fantasy VI went for steampunk, Final Fantasy VII went for cyberpunk. There were no evil empires. In fact, the government didn't really exist. It was formally there, but nobody ever really talked about it and it had no power in any way. Instead, a power corporation by the name of Shinra ran the planet. And it ran it exactly how you might expect, tyrannically. But there are much bigger threats in the game that all revolved around a mysterious person named Sephiroth and his quest to become a god. We learned about the history of the planet, we learned about what Shinra was doing to the planet, we learned about much bigger threats of the likes of Meteor and Sephiroth, but most of all we learned about the protagonist, and we learned about him on a level we never would have. We got so deep into Cloud's psyche, we learned about who he loves, what he loves, what he doesn't like about himself, how much he's lying to himself about everything, and we never really got that deep into a video game character's head. I mean, it's not like many different developers had made attempts, but this was just something different. It was on a level that we hadn't seen before. And a lot of it was told through pre-rendered cutscenes. In fact, these became a ubiquitous part of gaming in general, having parts of the story told in animated sequences that weren't in the game engine are something that really went on for quite a while, and it started here, or at very least was popularized here. Aside from a major upgrade in the graphics, having polygonal characters and pre-rendered backgrounds, the game also featured an entirely 3D overworld map and entirely 3D battles. Battles were probably the most exciting Final Fantasy battles had ever been. They brought the team down to three, rather than four that we'd previously seen in pretty much every Final Fantasy game, and introduced a new feature to the active time battle system called the Limit Break. When you were hit in a battle, your limit meter would increase, and when you filled it up, you could use a special attack that you would gradually unlock as you leveled up. Final Fantasy's magic system isn't based on espers, or magic, or jobs, or anything like that. The magic system directly interfaces with the story. What everything is powered on, what has given Shinra its power in the world, is Mako, which they drill out of the planet and refine energy from. The magic system uses materia, which are small bits of condensed Mako energy, which generally appears as a liquid, but as a materia is obviously a solid. Every materia has different properties, and materia gets stronger from use. Final Fantasy VII is generally regarded for having popularized the Japanese role-playing game outside Japan. Yes, Final Fantasy VI was successful. Yes, Chrono Trigger was successful. But nothing on the level of Final Fantasy VII had ever happened, at least in that genre. It would be really hard to follow it up, and Final Fantasy VIII did everything it could to build on that success and in some ways really did build on it as far as the relationships between characters and created a very beautiful postmodern semi-utopia, but a lot of the time was very confusing and many people weren't always sure exactly what was going on. That being said, it had a lot of good elements to it. For instance, the love story that took center stage was perhaps one of the first that took place in such a high-profile game. The battle system was significantly changed between Final Fantasy VII and VIII, relying on a card-based system, which divided people a great deal. 
There are some people that think that the draw card system is perhaps the best thing that's ever happened. And I'm not joking about that, there are people who really love that battle system. And there are people that view it as too much of a departure. It's certainly innovated in that it reflected elements of card games that have become significantly more popular through the years. It's actually incredibly interesting to think about. Card games have always been popular, but not on the level they are now. Final Fantasy VIII in many ways tried a lot of new things, and it's to be commended for that. And it did really well. It got very high scores, albeit a little bit more split than Final Fantasy VII, and it sold really well. Its bizarreness can be alienating, but in other ways can be extremely interesting. As Square seems to do with Final Fantasy, after a few innovative games, they tend to do a game where they do sort of a retrospective on what they've been doing, go back through everything that they've done, take the best concepts and put them together into one thing. You could call Final Fantasy IV that, Final Fantasy VI that, and Final Fantasy IX that. Final Fantasy IX, by all accounts, looks the most like a traditional Final Fantasy game since Final Fantasy V. It's set in a world that feels very fantasy, very medieval. It certainly had the upgraded graphics and in a lot of ways was the best looking of the PlayStation Final Fantasies, while also feeling very traditional and even in its own way very nostalgic. Then along came Final Fantasy X, which is a shockingly huge game. Final Fantasy X was bright and colorful and pretty, but at the same time had a very depressing sort of downtrodden feel to it, because you sort of knew everything was coming to a head in a bad way. Final Fantasy X modernized so many aspects of Final Fantasy, but at the same time took a slight step back in the battle system, moving from the active time battle to something they called conditional turn-based. The game also had a rather ingenious way of leveling called the Sphere Grid that could pretty much allow for any upgrade path for any character. For instance, if you want to make the main character Titus into a healer, a white mage type, you could, just as you could make just as you could make Yuna his love interest, who is by nature a white mage, into a brawler. But aside from an innovative leveling system, it also contains something that kind of blew everyone's mind, voice acting with facial animation, and a lot of it. The game has a more realistic style in its art, but it's heavily influenced by Final Fantasy III. Its battle system absolutely reeks of Final Fantasy III, and that's awesome for an MMORPG. It wasn't necessarily as detailed and beautiful, but Final Fantasy XI definitely had a depth to it that was not really possible in any other Final Fantasy title, in that you had a lot more freedom within the game world. It's also been widely touted as the most profitable Final Fantasy of all time. Final Fantasy XII hit in 2006 and is the first Final Fantasy with a truly open world, although it is split into zones. It's also the first Final Fantasy with a seamless battle system, as in, you encounter enemies on the map and you fight them on the map. But Final Fantasy XII really implements these ideas very well. It also runs off of something called the License System, which is not entirely unlike the Sphere Grid from Final Fantasy X, but does actually kind of function in a manner that it feels in-world which is very neat. It also takes place on the same planet that Final Fantasy Tactics and Vagrant Story supposedly do, and anybody who played Vagrant Story can definitely see the influence on Final Fantasy XII. Next came Final Fantasy XIII, which continued the AI battle partner dynamic, but offered a new way of controlling it, which was the Paradigm Shift. What's interesting about Paradigm Shift is it works kind of like the job system, but more as a means of governing the character. Final Fantasy XIII used active time battle, but the secondary characters were AI controlled. You would switch their paradigm, which included things like commando, saboteur, mage, knight, etc., and they would perform different sets of actions depending on the skills that they had. There was a lot of debate over this system, but generally it worked pretty well. It created very fast-paced battles that, despite still being a command-based battle system, felt very kinetic. The story of Final Fantasy XIII involves a world called Cocoon. The world itself is not a traditional world, but rather regions encased in an orb, so to speak. A cocoon. It's a fun game that is too linear for too much of the game. It does eventually open up, but still, the story is at least engaging, and it spawned two sequels and Troy Baker's in it. Final Fantasy XIV, however... Final Fantasy XIV was launched as basically a disaster. In many aspects, it was a legitimately broken game. The engine was bad, the systems were bad, and everything just came out weird. But what people hated the absolute most was the user interface for the game. It was clunky, 
it was ugly, and it was distracting. Final Fantasy XIII's game engine was used to create an essentially linear game, and an MMORPG that works right is anything but linear. In many respects, that was at the center of a lot of the problems with the engine. Fortunately, Square understood that this was such a failure that they completely revamped the game itself. New engine, amended storyline, and servers that worked. Over the course of its life, Final Fantasy XIV has went from unmitigated disaster to a pretty respectable game, and was generally regarded as one of the best MMOs of the last several years. Bringing us to the present, Square is a company that has learned a great deal about what exactly people want from them, because they've tried so many different things. It's not a mainline Final Fantasy game, but Final Fantasy Type O introduced a non-turn-based gameplay structure that was received actually very well, and Final Fantasy XV has done the same. First off, Final Fantasy XV is obviously the best looking Final Fantasy game that's ever happened. It takes a sort of techno-utopian idea that we've seen in some Final Fantasy games, but sort of adds a road trip element to it. And there's royalty, but the place in the world they fit is just sort of bizarre in a way. In any case, you're Prince Noctis, heir to the throne. And since it's new, we won't get too deep into the story. I highly recommend you play it because it just develops the idea of open world in a way that I really never expected Final Fantasy to. There's two halves of the game. The first is a lot less linear and the second is a little more, perhaps necessarily so. But the ideas put forth in the first half in my opinion, will influence all open world games from this point forward because it's so dense and filled with so much personality and has such an interesting way of going about all this, giving you vehicles, this massive world that feels more alive because of the way you transverse it. Because you drive around in a car, it's a little less important that absolutely every single place be packed with stuff, but at the same time, it is. This is such a lived-in world that seems much more, I don't know, real, despite it being basically bizarre if one were to describe the setting matter-of-factly. A prince and his buddies drive around the countryside and fight monsters, but the way that it handles the fighting works so well, it plays somewhere between an action RPG and in all honesty gives you a lot more options than you'd ever expect in a real-time fight. Man, I hope the Final Fantasy VII Remake plays like this, because they nailed it. And although it's a big departure in gameplay style for Final Fantasy, it's probably one that needed to happen, because it adds in a lot of modern gameplay elements and brings the game into a new era. But at the same time, it's continuing a tradition of these serious but utterly wacky games that transport us to different worlds and put us into the shoes of some remarkably similar but incredibly different people to ourselves. What's your favorite Final Fantasy game? Let's talk about that in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button. And if you're not subscribed, now is a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every single day of the week, and the best way to see them first is of course a subscription. As always, we thank you so much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on GameRanks.